Dr. Andrew Huberman's podcast has really blown up of late, and I've had some requests here and there for me to cover it. He's had a number of experts on, and while I'm not qualified to assess all of them because some have more to do with mindset, languages, and other areas outside of my scope of knowledge, I did see that he had Dr. Lane Norton, who has his PhD in nutrition, on the podcast, and I thought to myself, this is perfect. I listened to the whole episode on a six-hour drive through some gorgeous fall foliage along the East Coast, a really relaxing drive, but that's not what this is about. There were a few points that Dr. Norton and Dr. Huberman discussed that really caught my eye because, or should I say my ear, from how to improve your gut health, discussing the carnivore diet, and even saturated fats. So without further ado, let's begin with gut health. The biggest levers the three biggest levers you can pull is not eating too many calories, exercising. There's a, there is a connection between exercise and the gut and fiber. I realize he hasn't said much yet, but he actually doesn't go into the first two points that much and only focuses on fiber. So I'd like to mention a bit on the literature on overconsumption and exercise. So on the overconsumption side, there is growing evidence, like this one scientific review of almost 80 studies, that being overweight can lead to potentially unfavorable shifts in the colonies of bacteria found in your intestines. If you aren't familiar, your intestines house billions of bacteria that influence your health. So we'll get into exactly how once I shut up and let Dr. Norton describe some of the effects. But having the right bacteria in your gut can influence things like weight gain. And ironically, weight gain can influence more of the pro-weight gain bacteria to populate the gut. So it's a cyclical issue. I'd even add that the type of nutrients that you overconsume, like sugar or fat, can also have an effect on the population of bacteria. But there's so much more research that we need on the topic. Interestingly, exercise has a largely positive effects from an increased bacterial diversity, as well as higher proportions of bacteria that produce short chain fats. We'll touch on why that matters in a bit. But essentially, the greater your cardiorespiratory fitness, the more diverse and pro-short chain fatty acid producing bacteria that you will have in your gut. Additionally, the more intense the exercise, the better. These positive effects begin with the very first exercise session, so the effects are immediate. Again, another area where researchers are in the infancy of understanding. Of the things we know, dietary fiber seems to positively impact the gut because it is a what's called a prebiotic. So your gut microbiota can take, especially soluble fiber, although there's actually some evidence, at least in mice, that they, it might be able to use some insoluble fiber as well. Uh, I think Suzanne was doing a study looking at hemicellulose and actually seeing that some like specific forms of microbiota flourish with hemicellulose, suggesting that they may actually be getting some kind of fuel out of it, which is really interesting. Uh, again, in mice, so, you know, just huge caveat. So your gut microbiome can produce these short-chain fatty acids from... Uh, by fermenting uh, this, this, this soluble fiber. And there's quite a bit of evidence that these volatile fatty acids, which can be then actually uh, reabsorbed in through the liver, that they have some positive effects. Um, like for example, butyrate, when they've done butyrate supplementation, they've actually seen positive effects on insulin sensitivity. Okay, at this point, Dr. Norton goes into far more detail on the effects of fiber and gut health, especially in respect to the microbiome again. As promised, he goes into some of the mechanisms, which is something that I've discussed in a recent content looking at a scientific review on the microbiome. Dr. Norton and this review mentioned that the microbes, the bacteria in our intestines have the ability to take this fiber that we cannot absorb into our bloodstream and convert it to different short chain fats, one of which is butyrate. These short chain fats are associated with better health because they can be absorbed into our bloodstream and they interact with the liver. Once these molecules interact, and this is where we need more data, there is some evidence it activates mitochondria within the liver cells to oxidize more fats, 
meaning these mitochondria burn or utilize more fats, which reduces fatty liver disease, as well as improves body composition. In preliminary studies like this one, mice fed a high fat diet experienced less weight gain if they were also exposed to butyrate or derivatives that would come from the microbiome. Not only that, they experience increases in metabolism and improved blood sugar control and improved insulin sensitivity compared to mice fed only the high fat diet without these short chain fats supplemented. Now, again, this is all preliminary, but it's certainly promising and speaks to Dr. Norton's point. Fiber seems to be positive. Prebiotics seem to work much better than probiotics. Supplemented prebiotics. Yes. Yeah. So the problem with most of the probiotics is they're typically not concentrated enough to actually colonize. And even if you do colonize, what happens is, like, let's say you colonize um, some microbiota that you didn't really have much of. If you're not fueling it with the appropriate fiber, it's not going to stay anyway because it's essentially going to starve. So the research seems to really clearly suggest that eating enough fiber, which is, again, a prebiotic, that that is a better way to get a, a healthier gut per se than probiotic. Another important point is the discussion of pre versus probiotics. This is where I'm going to add a bit more information on another form that may even be more beneficial, symbiotics. At this point, we might as well just make up words and add biotic at the end. But anyway, Dr. Norton mentions that probiotics probably don't work well because they aren't concentrated enough. So he's right. That is one issue other than the delivery method, which can also present issues. Unfortunately, transplanting healthy bacteria in your gut does require maintenance because bacteria are living organisms and require nutrition just like our cells do. So ultimately, you can take the absolute best probiotic, but you'll need to change your diet or appropriately supplement to have those bacteria survive. But beyond that, even supplementing with fiber may not be sufficient because the population of bacteria change as a result of our overall health habits, not because of just one supplement. So this means that we need to focus on dietary changes that implement a variety of fiber sources. But I'd also like to mention something that Dr. Norton doesn't, something I covered in my series on the microbiome. There is something called a symbiotic, which is a combination of a prebiotic, a probiotic, as well as additional factors that help implant bacteria in our gut. It means that the bacteria will be delivered in an appropriate vehicle to pass the fires of Mordor, your stomach acid. And once in your intestines, they'll be given the nutrient resources to actually entrench and develop. A little like giving workers the, the proper tools to create a settlement. Uh, this increases the rate of success. But no matter what, I do think overhauling one's diet after the fact with some emphasis on fiber is the best route regardless. Kind of touching on that because I think it is important. Um, you know, a lot of people have kind of in the carnivore community said, well, you don't need fiber. You poop just fine without it. And I'll always say, well, pooping is the last reason to have fiber. Like, yes, it does help. It does seem to make uh, elimination easier. Uh, you can you know, do it more frequently, adds bulk to stool, but that's not why you should eat fiber. Why you should eat fiber is because of the effects on mortality. And you know, some of the pushback will be, well, this is healthy user bias. And what I'll say is- Meaning healthy people do this and therefore it's Healthy working people and eat more fiber and therefore- okay. yeah. And I mean, yeah, there's, there's something to that. But if it was just healthy user bias, typically you would see some disagreement between the studies. And, and a great example of that is like red meat. So not every study shows red meat has an association with cancer and mortality. There's, there's differences depending on the population used, depending on like what they define as high red meat, low red meat, whether it's processed, unprocessed. But I have not found a study on fiber and cardiovascular disease and cancer and mortality where it did not show improvements from higher fiber. So to me, that suggests that that, that effect is real.
Oh, this may ruffle some feathers, but he makes an excellent point. There are numerous studies on the relationship between red meat and cardiovascular disease or general mortality. And it's also true that some find a relationship and others do not, especially when separating out the types of meat like red versus white, processed versus unprocessed. This, of course, isn't a damnation of meat necessarily, but the argument could easily be made that there is far less unsure data in respect to fiber on all these outcomes. Across almost every study, there is an association between greater fiber intake and better health outcomes. And while I realize we're discussing associations, there are plenty of studies that also show direct effects on health metrics like blood pressure and inflammatory markers, as just a few examples. So while it might not mean that you'll necessarily be unhealthy for not consuming fiber, as one might not in a carnivore diet, it does mean that if you f do focus on consuming fiber in your diet, you're almost guaranteed to experience health benefits. The other thing that may be a consideration for the microbiome is there's some evidence that saturated fat may not be great for the microbiome, that it... Um, reduces the, um, the prevalence of some, some of the more positive strains of bacteria. And that appears to be um, not so much from the saturated fat itself, but from the bile end products that combine with saturated fat seems to have a negative effect on some of these more um, healthier forms of gut microbiota. Okay, there are a number of things to say here. First, because microbiome research is just picking up steam, the data we have is still limited, unlike a topic like fiber on overall health. But that said, I did find a small systematic review of 15 studies that indicated a few interesting points. One, greater fat consumption reduced overall microbiome content, which makes some sense considering if you're consuming a high fat diet, you're less likely to consume fiber. That's at least one reasonable mechanism. Two, the researchers point out that there is an inverse relationship between saturated fat and microbiota diversity, which means that as saturated fat intake increases, there's reduced microbiome diversity. Three, the researchers point out that too much monounsaturated fat also reduces microbiome diversity, yet polyunsaturated fats did not have this effect. I'm quite certain some of these conclusions will gain some added context over the coming years because they're based on extremely limited information. And Dr. Norton mentions a potential mechanism of bile acids interacting with saturated fat. That's all well and good, but I'd hold off on getting into any mechanisms until we have a more concrete data on the outcomes. Anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed Enjoyed this podcast between Dr. Andrew Huberman and Dr. Lane Norton. And if you're interested in learning more on the microbiome or more of these more detailed explanations of what other experts and gurus espouse, I'd certainly welcome you to check out the attached videos. I'll speak with you in the next one.